You can't miss the old-fashioned Coca-Cola machine and the empty bottles strewn about the floor when you enter the Emerson Studio Theater for the excellent production of Ismini by the Webster University Conservatory. Machines dispensing Coke and bottles may seem quaint now, but they were a common sight in post-World War II Japan when the play's author, Sato Makoto, was growing up. The Coke machine is a key symbol in the play, which is a reworking of Sophocles' Antigone. The title character is named for Antigone's younger sister. The backstory in his meaning is essentially the same as in its source. The two sons of the disgraced former king of Thebes have been killed in the civil war that broke out between the brothers over sharing power after their father's abdication. The new king, Creon, has forbidden anyone from touching the body of the rebellious son, Polynices, on pain of death. In spite of this decree, Ismini's elder sister is determined to bury Polynices. Sato's characters differ widely from their Greek counterparts. The unnamed elder sister is a rebel without the high-minded cause that motivates Sophocles' Antigone. Ismini's mother and blind father, also unnamed, are surprisingly well adjusted to the calamity that has befallen them. Uncle Creon whines about having the power he did not want to inherit. The distinctive traits of the characters are vividly drawn at the Webster Conservatory by Amanda De Pinto as elder sister, Peyton Hooks as father, Kate Fahey as mother, and J.R. Prusky as Uncle Creon. His meanie isn't like them. For one thing, she isn't constantly buying and drinking Coca-Cola, which is a symbol of the pervasive, corrupting influence of American capitalism. But she's trapped in a world she had no part in creating. Linda Cortez has the full measure of Ismini's confusion and yearning. One of her coping mechanisms is imagining an escape to another city. The conservatory staging includes a physical representation of this sailing reverie. The men who service the Coke machine participate in Ismini's fantasy after entering her warehouse-like home. The script refers to these two as nobody A and nobody B. They are amusingly working class and a bit mysterious, in the performances by Eleanor Robinson and Colleen Doherty. The movement is striking at the conservatory thanks to Jeff Uwada's direction and Josephine Starr's choreography. I would guess that Jamie McKittrick's intimacy coaching is important in the other's interaction with the body of the dead brother, who's played by Pierce Ablenap. Eric Peterson appears briefly as a soldier. The impressive look and sound for the production are established by Jordan Long's scenic design, Ashton Russ lighting, Caitlin Anderson's costumes, Ansley Juan's hair and makeup, and Colin Marshall's sound. Samantha Merkin provides dramaturge notes well worth reading on the political background of the play and on the Suzuki techniques used in developing the production's movement. For me, it was fascinating to see how a play about the aftermath of an ancient war could be adapted to comment on the aftermath of a modern war in a very different culture. Yeah, and I appreciated, the, as you say, the dramaturg's notes uh, a, about the relationship of this play to post-war Japan. Uh, curious, well, interesting, uh, maybe it's not curious, but it makes sense how popular the Greeks seem to be these days to be adapted into various fascinating plays that we've been seeing. Yes, indeed.